Good day to you. The other night, my wife and I went to dinner at a couple's house. We were having some fun there, and all of a sudden, they started to receive one phone call after another. Who was the phone call from? It wasn't a person. It was their security company. They had some kind of problem with their software and their security camera system at their house that was sending a message that there was a break-in to the security company, and the security company kept calling with an automated message, not a person, but an automated message where Frank... Our friend was supposed to push one if he needed help. I wouldn't exactly call that a relaxing situation with this company calling. How ironic, I thought, as we sat there in a house where probably a security system was purchased for the exact opposite reason, to give them the comfort and feeling of security in their house. But here they had this jarring phone call coming in on top of wondering whether the security system was really working. And to me, that's really what security systems do to people. They don't make them feel safer at all. They make them feel more paranoid. They disrupt their lives. They get people to have to commit time and energy to getting through the various barriers to set up their security systems. That's just my opinion. You can judge for yourself as we make our way through this chapter material today because we're talking all about surveillance. Surveillance in the internet age and particularly as it takes place on Facebook. And how is surveillance related to security systems? Well, that's what we're going to talk about in the lecture today. As we take on chapter 7, take on this chapter talking about surveillance and Facebook and a person who's going to become central to this chapter by the end of the chapter named Edward Snowden, an ex-CIA employee. So let's get into it. The author uses SNS to describe social networking sites. I'm not sure if people are using that terminology today, but he starts out the book by saying SNS sites, social networking sites, display connections, connections between users, and communication between users. That's what they do. They're providing information that shows connections. That means who people are friends with or who people have as followers. It shows connections between the users. You can see the connections between the people who are followers, not across all platforms, but you can see the people who are knowing each other. You can see other people who are knowing each other. And you can also see the communication that goes on between people and their postings and their tweets and their photographs and their and their snaps. So this is the kind of information that's being exposed. And, and Conceivably, there could be a lot of private information in there, information that you want to keep to yourself. And so that's the entry point by which we start to talk about this chapter, that, that SNS and sites automatically provide information that is going to bring up questions about privacy. Now, if you watch the film, The Social Network, the film that was supposed to be a biography of Mark Zuckerberg and his friends and how they started Facebook, you will see a kind of ideology in that film, Fuchs says, which is typical of the ideologies that have been presented about Web 2.0, that if you watch this film, that it's really about a, a group of young Harvard talented students. And they came up with this application to create connections between people online on their college campus. And then it exploded and went all around the world as a successful, profitable business. But what that, what that movie ignores is that Mark Zuckerberg in particular, but the whole Facebook crew benefited from venture capital. Venture capital is a kind of investment that takes place by firms that are just in the business of making investments in other people's projects. It's like Shark Tank if you've ever seen that on television. And so Mark Zuckerberg is not this, you know, Alger Hiss story. If you know that, it's a, an American folklore from some writings in the early part of the 1800s, a rise of rags to riches. Zuckerberg wasn't like that. He was a privileged person, and he was able to, to leverage a big investment to grow this company, uh, this company very big. And what is this company? This, this company is not about sharing content, Facebook. This company is an advertising-based capital accumulation model that relies on the constant influx of advertisement investments and confidence by other businesses that those advertisement investments are going to yield increased purchasing traffic. So in other words, Facebook is trying to get advertising investments all the time. And the reason that they're investments is because advertisers never really know if they put a Coke ad on a Facebook page, whether that's going to increase business or not. But that's the model. It's an advertising-based capital accumulation model that relies on the constant influx of advertising and advertisements and also confidence by other businesses who are purchasing those ads. And Facebook shares are doing very, very well. I looked at Facebook shares. I got them right here on the computer. Um, 2009, 
Facebook shares. We're at, uh, yeah, annual revenue, sorry. We're looking at annual revenue right now. I'll come back to Facebook shares in a minute, but annual revenue is $777 million in 2009, which is nothing compared to 2018. Facebook's revenue today is, get this, 55, almost 60, almost 56 billion dollars in the year 2019. And that was a much better than the previous year of 2017, where the revenue was $40 billion. So in one year, it's gained an extra $15 billion from this very, very successful business model. And, and I just looked up the, the Facebook share price today is $207. When Christian Fuchs was looking at the average share of, uh, of Facebook on the stock market today, he was uh, saying that it was around $55 in his research. Today, today $270 for a, $7 for a single share of Facebook. Part of Facebook's strategy has been through its acquisition strategy, its acquisitions to purchase WhatsApp. WhatsApp is not an app that makes money off of advertising, so Facebook is still trying to figure that out. But it purchased WhatsApp because uh, it allows people to communicate outside of their normal cell phone provider. So they don't have to use a Verizon app, for example, or Messenger, etc. So this is a very important part to Facebook's business model to extend into that area. Facebook also purchased Instagram, the use of photographs primarily to, to, to communicate Facebook put, purchased Snap2, which is a mobile phone um, application generating company. Facebook purchased Atlas, which is a targeted advertising company. It targets ads at people based on their IP addresses. Facebook put, purchased Face.com, which is photo tagging software that now gives you the chance to put names to the photographs that you put on or, or allow Facebook to assign those names on itself. So Facebook has had an acquisition strategy where it acquires company to achieve vertical integration. If you know what that is from business classes where they are able to control several different phases of the content production process. They control the creation of the content by users. They control the distribution of that content through Facebook. Uh, they can tr control the advertising of that content. That's vertical integration. And Facebook also has horizontal integration as well. That's buying like-minded companies. You can say that Instagram was similar to Facebook because you can post photos on both, but Instagram had that as a stronger brand. So it purchased that so Facebook did so it wouldn't be a competitor. So Facebook is, this, is a monster company. It's absolutely, it's too big to imagine, you know, with all the money that it's making. Now, let's go on to talk about privacy. It was a concept that was introduced earlier on. We're talking about privacy. We're talking about security. We're talking about surveillance. How are they all related today? Actually, privacy is one of the bedrock values that societies have had to consider. And, and there are various notions of what privacy actually entails. And Fuchs talks about three definitions. Um, sort of the standard definition of privacy that the average person would think of is it's the right to be left alone. I want my privacy. I don't want to be bothered right now. That's sort of the common person's conception of privacy. But there are also three other conceptions of privacy that Fuchs covers. One is known as a restrictive access theory, a restrictive access theory to privacy, which says that it's all about quarantining information and not letting people get to it. It's like a no trespassing sign. That's what privacy is about. It's about putting a padlock on your lockers and nobody can go in and steal your gym bag. It's, it's blocking access. It's restrictive access. This is different. Uh, th that is a different kind of theory from a control theory of privacy. Control theory of privacy places the emphasis on self-determination over the information. So it's up to you to decide what you want to keep private and what you want to keep what you want to make public. That's what a control theory is. And and this theory is mainly is what is at play in Facebook because it's offering all these settings that allows you to make it. Saying, hey, it's here in your hands. You don't want um, to see certain posts from a person who's annoying you. You can block that off. You can make it private. You can make them private. You can make you be private away from them so that they can't, they can't get to you. Um, you can change other settings on there for advertisers as well. We'll talk about that later on. It's basically about you can have privacy under this privacy control access theory model. You can have privacy still if private information becomes known about you as long as you're the one who's deciding to release it. So it, it places a lot of the, of, the, of the comfort and convenience on the usual, the user that control theory. Compare that to the limited control theory, which is, which is a combination of both. However, what, the, what this uh, does not 
um, look at these two theories, uh, the three theories altogether, the third one combining the two, is that privacy uh, should be criticized. Because there is a belief in the American system that privacy can cause no harm, and critical theory says that that's not the case. That actually, that actually this idea of stressing self-determination is, is not always good because privacy can deepen inequality. It can deepen inequality. Take, for example, the Swiss banking system. The Swiss banking system allows companies from all over the world to deposit millions of dollars and not to divulge that they have those accounts. They are private accounts. Nobody can see how much is in there. Nobody knows who's depositing those accounts. Nobody knows where the money's come from. And so as a result, you have a lot of black money in Switzerland. You have a lot of money that's made off of illegal sales of arms, for example, guns around the world, and then money's stuck in those Swiss bank accounts. It's an example of privacy here is not serving societal interests. That financial privacy, in this case, in the context of Swiss bank accounts, can actually support tax evasion. It can support black money, as I mentioned, and, and it can, it can, it can um, keep secret wealth income gaps. People making much more money than their employees, and whether that's fair or not. So, in other words, there is a contradiction, Fuchs says, in, if we're talking about contradictions through the whole course, there's a contradiction between privacy and capitalism. And it takes place in Facebook and Google. There's a contradiction there. And, and, and that the Facebook, like most social media platforms, are promoting themselves as helping people to share. That's what it's all about. Help people share. And Zuckerberg even has stated, and it's in the Facebook mission statement as well, that all of this is to make the world a more open place. To make the world a more open place. However, however, People who are using Facebook and Google and Instagram and all the rest of the social media platforms, what Facebook doesn't mention is those people are not sharing just with each other. You're not just sharing with your sister who's now living in California. You are sharing with Facebook, who is sharing with advertisers, who is, as we'll show later in the, in the chapter, sharing with the government. So there's more than just sharing between friends going on here. And, and Mark Zuckerberg, what a hypocrite. Christian Fuchs points out, if he wants the world to be such an open place, then why has he bought four estates and places, and why does he bought four estates that are circling his house? So he has his central complex in Palo Alto, California, and then he bought four estates around it so that there's a buffer between his estate and somebody, so nobody can look in his, uh, at his front lawn, so nobody can, can get through his privacy, get through to his pr privacy. And, and in fact, social media sites in general they are the most secretive um, companies there is. As we mentioned yesterday with Google, Google doesn't re, uh, make public its algorithm formula. We don't know that. It's a secret. It's a secret. Facebook is a secret. There's a lot of secret information that Facebook keeps sake, keeps it to itself. We saw some very basic figures here, but there's a lot of other detailed financial information that Facebook does not provide, like how many kids are being targeted by advertising. Is that, is that something that we should ask a question about? How many children and is that proper? Facebook is not able to, pro to provide that, not, does not have to provide that by law. So there is a contradiction in the capital system when it comes to privacy and security and surveillance, we'll get to those in a moment, between you, the user's interest in having their data protected, not having personal private information, and at the same time, corporate commodification wanting to get a hold of that information because that's the commodity that's being sold is that private data. So everything you did yesterday at Christmas, how much did you drink? Uh, did you have sex? Uh, did you take any pharmaceutical pills while you're eating? Um, did you call somebody a, a bad name? Did, did you um, give somebody a gift that you claimed was more expensive than it really was? Uh, these are private personal questions. You have an interest in protecting that. You have an interest in making sure that that's not well known, but that's, that's not what the corporations of Facebook and Google want, they want that information because it's going to translate into sales for them. So now let's move on to these two twin terms of privacy and surveillance and, and talk about what they mean. And we're going to cite a French philosopher, Michael Foucault, to introduce this part of the class. Uh, Michael Foucault says, in modern society, privacy is inherently linked to surveillance. Based on Foucault's notions of surveillance as disciplinary power, one can define surveillance as a specific kind of information gathering, storage, processing, assessment, and use that involves potential or actual harm 
coercion, violence, asymmetric power relations, control, manipulation, domination, or disciplinary power. That's what surveillance has historically been used for. It's historically been an instrument of control to keep you under watch. And in fact, the idea is that surveillance is going to be coercive. The idea is that it's actually trying to force you from doing something because you believe that you're being watched rather than you choosing on your own not to do it. How many of you as teenagers went up to your rooms and shut that door and you were dreading going out of the house because your parents have a, an app that they're tracking your every movement. But right there in your own room, under their roof, you feel the most free that you can feel, and yet you're, you're still within their range because of a security surveillance tracking system that you have on your phone when you go out. So surveillance is coercive. It brings up resentment in us. It makes us try to get away with things. Private ownership is an extension from privacy. Privacy in the United States has also come to mean private ownership. Private ownership is key to a neoliberal society because it means people can own private property and the government cannot seize that property. So the private property that is operating on social media is just an extension of privacy. The private property that's being sold, the private property that you're purchasing according to ads, whether it's sneakers or a jacket or a hat, that's private property, it's an extension of privacy. Oddly enough, though, as we started to develop in the last chapter, the, the, the public sphere, which is not that well developed on social media, there is no nonprofit big area that everybody goes to communicate on. The private sphere is related to the public sphere because the private sphere is where ownership structures of social media and other companies can be kept private. So the private sphere is a separate sphere, sphere from the public sphere. The public sphere is where we talk about things for the common good. The private sphere is Facebook, Google, Snapchat, keeping their ownership structures, their wealth inequality, um, the, way, the way that they're making their money, keeping all of that secret. In other words, capitalism relies on anonymity. That's what it is, anonymity in order to function. At the same time, though, building trust requires knowing data about others. That's why you have profiles on Facebook. That's why you have the ability to study other people's web pages. It's so that you can build trust about them. Whether that trust is real or not or imagined is another question, but that's how we gain trust in the digital media world, by not violating other people's privacy. So now that we've established that privacy, as it's been discussed theoretically, academically, and in practical terms, is not necessarily the best conception of privacy for a critical theory examination of social media, we're going to move to an alternative notion of privacy. It may hang some of you up because Fuchs defines it as a socialist definition. Don't get hung up on that. You're not becoming a socialist um, by uh, adopting his definition here. And you can still disagree with the definition if you want. But he does introduce a different definition of privacy. And he said that it's more about protecting citizens from the surveillance of corporations. That's where the privacy should, it should not rest with giving people tools to control their own privacy. It, the privacy studies should be more about protecting people from government surveillance. The economic privacy is really undesirable that we really need to know where these companies are making their money so that we can decide whether they are moral or not, whether they should be broken up, and whether there should be competition that's entered into the picture. And that public surveillance in this kind of, of privacy system of the rich is, is unfortunately necessary because you need to make sure that people who are climbing to the highest levels of wealth in company structures that are taking your information that you're creating for free, that they're not continuing to exploit. And so public surveillance of the rich is necessary. This is where privacy should function. And that really what privacy should be all about is not surveillance of the user, but surveillance of capital accumulation that in, in order to protect the workers where the capu, the workers that are being exploited by the capital accumulation. All right, now let's move on to an area of ideology. We've talked about ideology in this class a few times. It's a way of seeing the world. It sneaks up on you. You don't realize you believe it necessarily. It's a, it's a hidden thought process, a hidden belief system. And uh, Fuchs, interestingly, I think, talks about liking on Facebook as a Facebook ideology, liking. The idea that there is no un dislike button. You can unlike a like, but you can't dislike something. And uh, Fuchs talks about Coca-Cola in here and how, 
how popular Coca-Cola is and how many likes there are. It's, it's Facebook creating what he calls an affirmative culture. And so I'm on Coca-Cola right now and Facebook right now. And here's an example of what Fuchs is talking about. <clears throat> if I want to reply with a like, <clears throat> look at my choices there. Uh, the first three from left to right, I know this image may be reversed on your screen, but the first three, if you look from left to right, are a thumbs up, a heart, and then a, a laughing face. So those are three positive icons. And then in the middle, we have a neutral one. It looks like a, just a, a look of a surprise or astonishment. And then the two to the right are, um, are negative faces. And so we have an example of Facebook's affirmative culture here, the liking culture, where it's, it's geared more towards liking things and affirming things than it is towards, towards um, disconfirming things, towards pushing things away. It's an affirmative atmosphere. And the emojis and the happy faces are all about that. But there is a logic about it that is absolutely absurd. Uh, and Fuchs talks about a great example, the Auschwitz was a, a Holocaust uh, camp, an incineration camp, a concentration camp in Germany. And uh, they held a memorial service. And, and on their webpage, they mentioned how many uh, Jewish people were exterminated in that concentration camp. And the absurdity of Facebook is that the one of the options is to like the webpage. So you're liking, think about that, you're liking in a way that People were exterminated. It's, it's the way that language is constructed on face, not what you're meaning to say, but that's what happens. So liking, liking is an affirmative ideology. And you can see people the way that they also react. If somebody says, I've had a bad day. Oh no, hope you feel better and get better soon. I mean, it's, it's like inviting that all the time. Not that there isn't negative commentary on Facebook, not that there's not arguments, especially when it comes to politics. But the, the, the overarching ideology is one of liking, it's one of positivity. Now let's introduce another word that we've used a few times in the class. It's also part of the, the language of Marxism. It is that word fetishism. And we're going to talk now about the liberal fetishism of privacy. Remember, fetishism is something that appears to be normal and we accept and therefore never really critically examine it. And so we don't try to change it, doesn't go away. And it's usually something that's not good. And so liberal theories of privacy, as I'm hoping to show here through what I've talked about so far, is actually building up a fetishism of privacy, that it's all about autonomy and independence and trust. That's the value of privacy. And there are other words that Fuchs uses to describe all the ways that we think about privacy, all very positive. But what, what, what liberal theories do not uh, pay attention to is privacy and capitalism. They do not pay attention to private property, don't pay attention to capital accumulation, do not pay attention to social inequality. And so we have a fetishism of privacy that we're, we're not going to change it. The desire for privacy tends to develop, by the way, in societies where the public sphere has very complex relationships. So our public sphere is very complex. First of all, it's hard to find one. And then if we try to make a public sphere on Facebook, it's all influenced by our status relations with others and our power relations. And so it's very complicated what we say on Facebook. That's why there's so much anxiety from social media. And so in a situation like that where the public sphere is complicated, the private sphere becomes more, more important. And it starts to develop a discourse that actually encourages victimization discourse. It's another problem that comes with, with cybersecurity. So in what we're talking about when we're talking about with cybersecurity and internet security and all the other methods of security that you can purchase today, what we talk about them providing is it will help you from cyber stalking. It will help you from sexual harassment. It will help you from data theft. It's all about a discourse that is, is creating more fear in the part of people than it is really providing comfort and security. All right, now let's talk again about private and private property in a little bit more detail. We wanna introduce the philosopher Hannah Arendt here. And she said that modern privacy is a sphere of deprivation. That when we are setting up all these privacy settings on social media, that, that what we are really doing is we are depriving ourselves from interaction with the outside world. And that, they, that Facebook, as a social media platform that we're featuring the most in this class today, it uses mass surveillance and also personalized surveillance to gather our data to sell to private companies. It's, it's surveying on a mass scale, but also it knows really individual details about your own personal activities because of, your, because of what you yourself are telling Facebook. 
So Facebook does not, does not speak of selling user-generated info in its privacy statement. It's not talking about private property at all, Facebook. It doesn't say that we are collecting data so that we can sell that data to third-party companies so that you can be targeted with advertising. It doesn't say that in the privacy policy. It asks about catering its information to users to help them share and to make the world a more open place. And there are no privacy settings on Facebook to disallow users uh, to, to allow users to disable advertiser access to data. You can disable some advertising on there, but you can't disable that your data, whatever you type, is going to be sold. You can't disable that. All right, now let's move to Edward Snowden. We said we we're going to introduce him earlier. Edward Snowden, an American, an American who went to work for the CIA. And while he was working for the CIA, he discovered several companies that were collecting data on consumers and supplying that data to the National Security Agency, the NSA, which was doing threat assessments all the time on potential terrorists. So how does consumer data get caught up in potential terrorists? It depends what you're purchasing, right? If you're purchasing sulfur, for example, you could be purchasing it for a, a chemistry experiment for your son who's in eighth grade, or you could be purchasing a chemical to, to build a bomb. And so that's ostensibly what the NSA is interested in. Edward Snowden discovered that there are these three really big companies are doing that. I'll talk about those companies in a few in a few moments. But before we get to actually the companies that, that Snowden introduced, let's set up what what a broad concept of surveillance has been like for us and how it's really not well suited to critical theory. Before we get to Edward Snowden. Um, as we've tried to, to show here so far, surveillance in the way that it's talked about, especially by the industry, is very positive. It will make you feel safe and secure. I mean, uh, you pull up into somebody's driveway and you see that sign that says there's a security system in place. It's supposed to supposedly make you feel safe and secure. But Fuchs is arguing, no, we need, in this case, we need a negative concept of surveillance. We need, a ne we need to have a negative view of it. Because what is surveillance? It's watching over. It's watching over somebody, which sets up a hierarchy in society because the person who's doing the watching over is either more moral, has more power, has more financial resources. So it sets up, again, our social relations are being affected by a technology here. And corporate and state surveillance, by the way, are the most dominant forms of surveillance there is. It's not you, the individual person. Individual person. It's not citizen groups. It's not profit, not nonprofit groups. It's the big federal government. And it's big companies, especially social media companies. They're the ones who are the dominant surveillance. And these, these two entities are working together. They are working together. It raises all kinds of ethical questions, like can employers have surveillance cameras at work to monitor their employees' behaviors at work? Do you work in a place right now where you're on camera all day long? What about when you go to sneeze? Uh, what about if you pass gas? Is that okay to be captured? I mean, it's a moral question. We haven't defined it yet. And, and there's this idea that we talked about earlier, again, talking about how our social relations are affected by social media and the technology that's used, is that preemptive surveillance that is, assume, that is record first and ask questions later assumes guilt before innocence. It assumes your guilt on camera or that you could be potentially guilty and the camera is going to prove whether or not you are or not. It's a, it's a completely different assumption in our society. And so what we have here is a surveillance state that we're living in today, and it was ushered along very quickly by 9-11. After 9-11 and how vulnerable our nation be felt that it had become to terrorist strikes, we had a whole bunch of laws that were passed. We had a whole, we had a growth of the security industry in every way, shape, and form, web cameras, uh, software, um, security systems, uh, all this stuff that you're supposed to purchase to make you feel safer that came about and we now live in what could be called a safety state a safety state in which the war against terror is discussed as a as a as part of security discourse those are the kind of phrases that we're using because of the security industrial complex and we have a vicious cycle that has developed between hatred and conflict if you feel that like you're being watched you want only to not be watched. And so you'll watch another person. It, it's, it's a vicious cycle. It does not create the best um, human motivations to be under surveillance. We can even say that, that uh, our relations with Mexico and Canada, the United States, are influenced by this security language when we talk about immigration and border crossings and, and securing the country. 
All right, now back to Edward Snowden. So that's sort of been the broad way of looking at surveillance before a critical theory gets into the picture and says, no, surveillance is negative. And, and that's what Snowden was trying to do, is trying to point out that the U.S. government's surveillance was negative. He found three companies, PRISM, um, X Key Score and Tempora. You should Google them and you should Google him and, and read some more about his biography. He's very interesting. These are large scale internet surveillance systems, large scale. They are surveying servers, they're surveying individual computers, and they're surveying the communications that go on between servers and individual computers on the part of consumers. And they are sharing this information, these three companies, or they were, with intelligence services in Germany, the UK, and the United Kingdom, which were then sharing information among themselves. And what are these three companies, these three software platforms looking at? They're looking at your browsing histories. They're looking at your online searches. They're looking at your online chats. They're looking at your emails. And so we have the cooperation between the most powerful entities in the world, corporations and government, to try and to get a hold of of our private information. And so another way of looking at big data, the term that we haven't revisited in a while, is that big data is big surveillance. It's big surveillance based on technological determinism, the idea that putting cameras in your house is going to make you feel safer. The idea of a car alarm that goes off is going to make you feel more settled in your environment. The idea that you have a webcam at your home while you're away from home in case you anybody breaks into your house is supposed to make you feel safer, calmer, more at peace. It does not. Frank and Nancy, who had us over for dinner, they were not at peace when this automated robocall coming in from the security company kept coming. So surveillance is not democratic and it's not participatory in the true senses of the terms that we've used because it clearly favors big corporations and government. And the way that it takes place surveillance is because of the TCIP, sorry, TCP slash IP internet protocol. If you're not a computer scientist, don't worry about it. It's basically the establishment of IP addresses. Every time you go online with your phone or your computer, you have an IP address that's associated with your phone or computer, and your whereabouts are immediately known, as well as everything that you're typing on the internet. So every device that's connected to the internet is being surveyed across every, every uh, particular function of it. Uh, internet surveillance, in essence, leverages fear into capital accumulation. I guess that's the central point of the class. And a final quote to wrap things up and to leave us with a closing comment to settle out this chapter is on page 206. Policing looks for security by algorithms in a world of high insecurity. It advances a fetishism of technology, the belief that crime and terrorism can be controlled by technology. Technology promises an easy fix to complex societal problems, this explains the results that the security industry tends to justify the selling of surveillance technologies with reference to the ideological assumption that more surveillance is needed to fight crime and terror.